Welcome to Creating Wealth with Jason Hartman. During this program, Jason is going to tell you some really exciting things that you probably haven't thought of before and a new slant on investing. Fresh new approaches to America's best investment that will enable you to create more wealth and happiness than you ever thought possible. Jason is a genuine, self-made, multi-millionaire who not only talks the talk, but walks the walk. He's been a successful investor for 20 years and currently owns properties in 11 states and 17 cities. This program will help you follow in Jason's footsteps on the road to financial freedom. You really can do it. And now, here's your host, Jason Hartman, with the complete solution for real estate investors. Welcome to the Creating Wealth Show. This is episode number 228, and I'm your host, Jason Hartman. Thanks so much for joining me today. We've got a very timely and special show for you today, slightly off the real estate investment topic, but I think you'll find it to be valuable in business and life. And before we get to our special guest today, who is the author of The Steve Jobs Way and another book about Steve Jobs entitled Icon. And so we'll get to that in a moment here, but I wanted to talk to you about a few other things. First, and and I think this is very timely with the passing of Steve and all the stuff he's done. And you're going to hear some really interesting perspective about someone who worked for him directly at Apple in the early days from 1980 to 1986. So pretty amazing story, really. And I think you'll really enjoy this interview as much as I did. So I'll have that for you in just a moment here. But a few things first. First of all, I hope you are joining us at the St. Louis tour coming up November 11th. Really looking forward to that. I'm using that trip to visit a couple of our cities as well, starting with Kansas City, then going to St. Robert, then St. Louis to meet with you, hopefully, and then on to Indianapolis after that. So I'm doing all this in pretty quick succession. But I did book my tour for Monday morning of the St. Louis Gateway Arch. So join me for that too, and we'll do something really touristy and fun. Uh, I actually made a reservation for that because I did not want to miss it. You know, that is 600 feet in the air. I've just always wanted to see that, and I've, I've never had the chance to. So besides the real estate investing, just for a little fun and a little tourism, we can do that Monday morning as well in St. Louis if you join us for the tour. And you can sign up for that, of course, at jasonhartman.com, and I look forward to seeing you there. A couple of things. Number one, as we have been talking about on the show, the rental market is booming. I mean, booming with a capital B. And folks, I tell you, it is only going to get better from so many perspectives. I mean, think about the future that investors have right now. They've got foreclosures in their favor. Why is that in their favor? Well, because millions and millions and millions of Americans, whether strategically or just through unfortunate circumstances, have decided at one level or another, decided or by default, they have really, really damaged their credit. And that means they will be renters for many years to come, probably. So that is one big factor. The other huge factor is demographics. And of course, we've talked about on that on previous shows. We've got the recycle from homeowners coming into the housing market. That's a big one, no question about it. But we've also got the situation where we've got so many Gen Y people moving into the rental market. And I say, actually, we also have, and we have not talked about this before, but a lot of baby boomers moving into the rental market. And then we've also got the people who've just sort of lost faith in the housing market, in the American dream, as it were, where you simply buy a house and it just goes up in value perpetually and that kind of stuff. That's probably not in our future. And there are so many articles in the media about that. This is all really good for us as investors because we have got tens of millions of new renters coming at us. You know, I heard a statistic interesting the other day, and it said that 15% of males between the ages of 25 and 34 are living at home with their parents. Think about that. Think about the pent-up demand that creates, that is going to be coming at us, at us as investors. Us people who can provide housing to people will be very, very popular in the coming years. So that is really good for us as renters. Now, another thing that I wanted to mention in terms of one of our markets that we are doing very well in right now, investors are having very good experiences. Of course, this is not 
new in terms of a market, but I do have a few new kind of bullet points to give you about this market. Imagine a place that has had an increase in growth since the 70s, and it has added 1.1 million people just in the eight years from 2000 to 2008. It's the second largest metro area in the southeastern U.S., the ninth largest in the country. It's the top business city and primary transportation hub for the entire southeastern U.S. It's the fourth largest concentration in the country of Fortune 500 companies. It's world headquarters to big name companies like Home Depot, AT&T, Delta Airlines, TBS or Turner Broadcasting, Ted Turner, SunTrust Bank, Newell Rubbermaid, Coca-Cola, 75% of the Fortune 1000 have business operations in this city. Its airport has been the world's busiest airport for the last 13 years. It has a growing biotechnology center, and as of 2010, it is planning to become an IT health capital by adding hundreds of thousands of new jobs in that sector. Rates first in the U.S. for the least costly large city for businesses, so it's very business friendly. The second as America's best cities to relocate, third in the country for job growth, and Forbes magazine said it was the fourth most affordable U.S. market. It also ranked it, Forbes again we're talking about, as the number one rental market in the country. It has low property taxes. It has low homeowners insurance rates. It has a good inventory of housing, and we certainly have a very good vendor relationship with really two, well, really three vendors there. And we've been doing business in this market for a long time. As I mentioned before, it's a very business-friendly state. Growth prospects are very good for this metro area with 5.4 million people. Do you know what I'm talking about? Because I've mentioned a few of these things before on prior shows. This is none other than Hotlanta. Atlanta, Georgia. So check out the properties we have there at jasonhartman.com. Fantastic properties, fantastic investment opportunities. Last night I saw a really interesting movie entitled Margin Call. The movie was Margin Call, inspired by a true story, and they're talking about one of the big Wall Street firms there, and the subtitle or the tagline to the Margin Call movie, which I'd highly recommend, because it it just shows you what a crooked, greedy, money-grubbing operation Wall Street really is. The tagline for the movie is, Be first, be smarter, or cheat or cheat. It it just shows this company, this big investment house, and how they just unloaded just zillions and zillions of dollars, of course, that's figure of speech, of toxic assets onto the market and basically just destroyed other people, other investors, other businesses, other companies. A couple interesting scenes in the movie. One is where this young kid who's only 28 years old, who's making about three quarters of a million dollars a year at age 28, and his friend who's 23 is making a quarter of a million dollars a year, it shows where he discovered that this company was in a complete mess because it was so leveraged and it had invested so much in these completely bogus asset classes, these toxic assets. So this kid discovered it by finishing this computer model that another associate did who was the risk management person, the senior guy who was fired from the company. And he figured out this model that this company was on the verge of disaster. And in this these all-night meetings, and where they're figuring out how they're going to unload all these toxic assets onto other investors around the world. One of the senior partners in the firm asks him, because he didn't know him, he goes, hey kid, what's your background? How do you know this model is correct? And he basically said that he, he got a doctorate at MIT, and his doctorate was in essentially although he said it a different way, the way rocket propulsion engines interact and the friction they have against aerodynamic issues or something like that. I can't remember how he said it, of course. It was it was a late movie last night. I was a little bit tired when I was watching it. But then the senior partner says to him, so you're basically a rocket scientist. And he says, yeah. And he, and he says, well, why are you here? And he says, well, it's all just numbers. The money's just so much better on Wall Street. And you know, that to me was a very sad sad statement. 
because it shows you what so much of business around the world has become, but really so much of America. I think America is probably, you know, America and maybe some of the advanced European countries are the most guilty of this. We are not putting enough emphasis not even close to enough emphasis on this country on sciences, on engineering, on all of the the things that made us the world leader in so many areas that created this industrial revolution and Silicon Valley and and technology and all of this stuff. And and all of these guys on Wall Street, and they just showed this over and over in the movie Margin Call that I saw last night. All these guys on Wall Street, they don't create any value in the world. All they do is push money around and push numbers around. And it's just it's a smoke and mirrors game. It's an unreal economy. This is not value creation. This is handing things off to another guy. Okay, it's manipulation of markets. And the movie just through the whole movie, they they just illustrate that point beautifully. So I think the movie was really quite good. It had Kevin Spacey and Demi Moore. Gosh, what happened to her career? <laughs> she she's back and and in this movie. So it was really good. I'd highly recommend that you see the movie Margin Call. I know that so many of you are interested in the the, the story of the financial crisis and the crookery of Wall Street and all of that stuff. It's really quite interesting. We do have some listener questions piling up. We'll get to those hopefully on the next episode. But the Steve Jobs subject is so timely right now and there's just so much that has has been learned from that guy's life and and the incredible innovation and how he fostered it within Apple and how he fostered all of this innovation and created all these great products and and so forth and took Apple back from the brink of disaster. And you're going to hear that in this interview with Jay Elliott on the Steve Jobs way and and also touching on his other book, Icon. But one of the best quotes I saw, we all tend to make excuses from time to time about why things in our life aren't working out the way we want them to. I know we all go through this, obviously. But the best one that I really saw after Steve's passing was this quote. I saw it on Facebook. It says, given up at birth, dropped out of college, fired from Apple, and his second company failed, major comeback 11 years later, changed how the world communicates forever. What's your excuse? And you know what? That is really pretty inspiring. Or maybe it's not inspiring, but it just gives us a kick in the rear end that we all need once in a while to see how no matter where you came from in life, no matter what happened to you, no matter what your past, we cannot live in the past. We've got to live in the present because the present is how we exert control over our future. And here on the Creating Wealth Show, this is what we're all about. We're all about taking small steps today by getting our investment portfolio together and creating passive income by putting all of these negative parts of our government, our financial system, and and the, the complete scam that Both of those things are, okay? And putting them in our favor and exploiting those things to our benefit. So every time you hear about how the government is overspending, how the crooks on Wall Street are screwing the investors, which they seem to do as part of, that's just their business plan, really. (laughs) And And you hear about all of this stuff and you realize that you can put time on your side, you can put irresponsible government on your side, because irresponsible government means too much spending, and that means money printing, and that means inflation. And what that means to you as an investor is it means increase in value of your packaged commodities, your packaged commodity investing, and it means destruction of your debt. Remember my phrase, inflation-induced debt destruction. And all of that debt, or more than all of it, because the debt coverage ratios now on the investments we have nowadays are far above one meaning that you have positive cash flow after debt. But before debt, you get to outsource the debt to your tenant. I mean, it is the most beautiful tax-favored asset that you get to control. It is just wonderful. And you know what? As I've mentioned on prior shows just recently, I even like lending on it, which I never really liked before. And I like it because I can do it on a short-term basis and get rates exceeding 10, even 12%. So a lot of opportunities on either side of the income property, real estate investing, rental property equation. But I don't want to be in speculative things because remember my rule, if it does not produce income, it does not 
qualify as an investment. If it doesn't produce income, it's not an investment. It is a speculation, which is tantamount to gambling. Now, gamblers win sometimes. Speculators win sometimes. Certainly, I won't deny that for a moment. But for my money, being the conservative investor that I am, I do not want to gamble. I do not want to speculate. When you're in something like vacant land, raw land, precious metals, non-dividend paying stocks, you are a gambler. You are a speculator. And you can try and outsmart the system, and sometimes you will, and sometimes you'll just be lucky. And I would rather be lucky than good any day of the week, but I can't rely really on either of those things. What I can rely on is income. Income is pretty darn reliable. So whether that income comes from a short-term high interest rate trustee investment, where I'm getting 3,600% more than the bank pays, or in income property investment, where I'm controlling packaged commodities, buying them far below construction or replacement costs. I'm diversifying geographically, so I'm not just in one area, hedging my bets that way. And I know I've got this huge demographic coming at me as an investor. I mean, that is a beautiful thing. And every time I say me, replace that with you. Because when you put yourself in that position, that's exactly where you'll be. You will be in the spot where you are really just master of the universe. You're Captain Kirk on the Enterprise, where you're sitting in the big chair and you're controlling things. And rather than giving them up to these people I saw in the movie Margin Call last night who are acting out a bunch of their agendas and their motivations, which are most of the time contrary to ours as investors. Anyway, that's pretty much it for the real estate talk on this show (laughs) today on this episode. Let's talk about one of the great innovators of the last century and this century, and that is, of course, Apple founder Steve Jobs. And we will be right back with that interview with Jay Elliott, his right-hand co-worker for many years and longtime friend, and we'll be back with that in just a moment. Jason provides an extremely unique service, Deal Evaluator. Are you interested in a property outside of our network? Need a second opinion? No problem. Let our experts evaluate the deal. Find out more about it at jasonhartman.com. The price is only $50. My pleasure to welcome Jay Elliott to the show. He is the author of something that's very timely right now, The Steve Jobs Way, I Leadership for a New Generation. And since Steve Jobs' passing, I've learned a lot of things I didn't know about him, and I'm sure we'll learn a few more on this interview today. Jay, welcome. How are you? Fine, thanks. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Well, the Steve Jobs way, uh, we've heard a lot about Steve Jobs lately. Obviously, millions and millions of people have. And just this outpouring of news about him and and the significance of his life, it's really bigger than I thought it was. And I'm a huge Apple fan. I'm sitting here with my iPhone and and two Apple computers on my desk. And I guess I'm a cult member. (laughs) Uh, Switched from PCs and have really never looked back too much. But tell us about the book and and your thoughts on all the news recently. The book hit the market actually back in April. So that's when the book got published. I wrote the book because I was interested in documenting my... I worked for Steve for five and a half years directly. And I felt that it, it was my experience. I'd also worked previously at IBM and Intel, so I had a pretty good insight to corporate operations. And when I met Steve, he's a lot younger than me, and I had to make a decision even to go to work for him because I'd never worked for somebody who's that much younger than myself. And so I did it, and it really changed my life, and it changed really the direction of how I perceived the way leadership should be in corporations. And um, and Steve's success had, was no secret to me. I knew he was going to be successful. And so I decided I I wanted to document sort of the understanding, the philosophy behind why he was successful and why Apple was successful. So that... That really is the purpose of the book. Now, now you were there, and so for the listeners, it's important to understand the context of what you're saying, because when you said you always thought Steve would be successful, so obviously you were there in the early days, and I guess your tenure was 1980 to 1986? Uh, yes, that's true. So I was I started in 1980. I met Steve at a, at a restaurant in a local, um, in a local restaurant here where I live, and uh, by happenstance, and he was very excited about himself and the company, which I'd, at that moment I'd never heard of Apple, and um, 
and I was looking for a new, I'd been at IBM and I went to Intel, I was looking for something new to do and that worked out great. So I was, I worked directly for Steve in two capacities. One, as I was the head of, uh, was the senior vice president of operations, so running the corporate operations, working for Steve as chairman of the board. And then the way the company was organized, there was a division called the Macintosh division. So I worked directly for Steve, sort of his right-hand guy in building the Macintosh. Amazing. When you talk about management style, I remember when I was just a kid seeing videos of Steve Jobs, and I remember Steve Wozniak and his Us Festival, and uh, (laughs) I I remember it being so revolutionary that he had these weekend retreats, and and I I remember seeing the, the video of that where everybody was wearing blue jeans, and back in that day, that was sort of unheard of in corporate America, wasn't it? Yeah, and even Silicon Valley, when I first met Steve, I, he was wearing a white t-shirt and jeans and Birkenstock shoes, and um, in Silicon Valley at that time was dominated pretty much by IBM and HP, Fairchild and um, and Intel, so they were much more buttoned down, more formal kind of corporations. And to see a guy who's only 25 years old, who's the CEO of a corporation, it really wasn't the way it was. And obviously, even that set a whole new standard for what Silicon Valley is today. And so going to work for Apple was interesting because I'd been used to wearing, you know, either suits and ties and white shirts, and then to go to work for a company where you can wear, you know, Levi's and uh, and the T-shirt was a whole different experience. So 1980 at Apple to 1986, I mean, give us an idea of what the company was like back then. How, how many employees are we talking about? I mean, we're out of the garage by 1980, right? Yes. At the time when I joined in 1980, the company was doing about $10 million a month in sales. So the Apple II was right, it was starting its ramp up, was starting to do very well. So we're doing about $10 million in sales. By 1986, when I left, we were doing $3 billion in sales. So you can see the kind of ramp up wow. that was occurring. And Amazing. at the other time of it, the Apple II was a great little product. It was selling well. It, there's a software product called VisiCalc, which is one of the first applications that drove its sales. And also, school teachers loved it because they could, they could uh, customize it for their classes. But Steve and I, we took a very famous tour to a place called Xerox Park, and this was a research center here in Palo Alto, California, that, that really was a driver of technology. And Xerox, when we got there, one of the things we saw, which was revolutionary, which changed the whole direction, was a thing called a mouse. And actually, Xerox had built the mouse back in 1978. In fact, most of the modern technology today that we use came from Xerox. Most of the things like USB drives and Firewire and all, of the, all the current stuff really was all developed by Xerox in the 70s. Unfortunately, Xerox did nothing with it, and they were using it sort of in their printer technology, but not in not in computers. And so when Steve saw the mouse, it really, he and his eyes lit up because he knew that the interface to a computer needed to be simple, and because people in those days looked at computers to be sort of fearful of them and didn't know how to use them, and what he saw was this release that anybody could use a computer. And if you look see today, I mean, that's where we are. And... Um, it's today it's anybody from you know th- four years old to 90 years old can use it because of the interface technology developed by by the Mac team so some people might say i mean look steve jobs and bill gates they were in the right place at the right time i mean how much luck was involved i mean i know steve jobs is definitely was a brilliant man and i love his products but at the beginning back in the old days of apple and you know microsoft how much of that was just Right place, right time. Well, I think timing was important, but you think about it. At that time, IBM was the number two corporation in the world. IBM was was huge. It was rated number two in the world. It had incredible research. It had all this stuff. In fact, the reason I left IBM, because I felt they should go into this direction, but they chose to protect their turf, protect their, their computer rooms, and not really go for making putting computers in the hands of people. And even when, even on both sides, so when here's these two guys, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs, you know, sort of stumble into this market that actually IBM did not want anybody to develop, but they showed all of a sudden that, hey, people want to use these computers and not be connected to a computer room. Uh, And Microsoft on the other side was brilliant enough, Bill Gates was, that he understood that he was a driving force for for IBM. And what IBM, again, made a huge mistake is, was allowing, allowing clones all of a sudden the Microsoft software was being run in anybody who had a computer from Dell to anybody else. So IBM made some massive mistakes. So one way you can look at it be luck 
The other side of it is here's the, the major computer corporation in the world that made some massive mistakes and they got and they paid for it. Sure, yeah, they they definitely <laughs> did. I think I think that had to be a huge hit to their ego in in those days. But this philosophy of how Apple was so different in wanting to control the hardware and the software versus Microsoft, that seems like the more open or maybe democratic idea of we'll make software and other people can make hardware and people can have more choice. And that that really, I would certainly say that really won for many many years until Steve came back. Back, and then they just started making such great hardware products and kind of like people came into Apple in the, in the last 10 years sort of in reverse. They bought their iPod, loved it. Maybe they got an iPhone, loved it. And then they finally got a Mac. Strange way to acquire customers, really. <laughs> <laughs> well, but Steve's always philosophy, which I agree with, and that was always the debate we had, was that, that you should have the whole product. So the product should be all in one. It shouldn't be part of its hardware and part of its software, you're dealing with two different companies. I think a lot of the problems with the Microsoft software has been that the hardware that's placed on isn't up to running. I think that was the the big problem with Vista. A lot of the hardware manufacturers put it on PCs that weren't really designed powerful enough to run the software. So secondly, the other part of it is is to make it all, all compatible. So the other thing about Apple is all these products that they built today are all compatible with each other. If you buy a Samsung phone and a Samsung computer, they're not compatible. One's running Windows and one's running Android. So I think that the whole the whole secret is to be this product centric that it all runs together. And then obviously iTunes became a really the glue that ran it all totally together. So I think that's sort of what went out, and then obviously adding the retail strategy to it is just it's amazing what it's done for the Apple business. And I think that, to me, is the, the, the centerpiece of what the business should be going forward. And, and I just have to make a, a personal user, consumer-based comment about that, is that, of course, I have Microsoft Office on my Apple computers, but... It is such a hassle. Every time you get a new Mac, everything just switches over beautifully, except the darn Microsoft products. That's, <laughs> right, exactly. That's, the, that's always the snag. And now with the iCloud, uh, it is all synced. So to now, if you're connected to iCloud at all, there's no, you don't need to worry about backing up. It's all done for you. And it's all synced across all your products. So it's, um, again, it's, just, it's a philosophy of the legacy, I believe, for Steve is this philosophy that it's, uh, it's all together as one family of products. Yeah, and see, the the sort of the hacker-type mentality, those people, and we both have friends that are like that, they don't like the Apple products because they say, well, you're you're prisoned in their ecosystem. But And I always say to them, yeah, but it's a really nice prison. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. But even for that, you know, that's, you know, they finally... Hey, if you want to build apps, you can go to the you can build apps for the for the iPhone, or even now for the Mac. So I mean, and that's opened up, not to open up the kernel or the system, but to open up. If you want to build apps, you know, be our guest. I mean, that's the other that's the other side of change for the Apple the Apple philosophy. Yeah, it sure is. Well, in your book, The Steve Jobs Way, you talk about Steve and his passion for the product. And I, I always sort of think that companies have three audiences, three main audiences. They have customers, they have employees, and they have shareholders or stakeholders. We'll include even vendors in that. They don't have to be public companies to have those kinds of stakeholders. But it seems like Apple has really pleased all three. Was it really built around the the product or is it around leadership. The title of your book is I Leadership. Where was the Steve Jobs magic? It was in the, well, the leadership came from the product. So Steve Jobs magic is, I want a product. I want it to be the best in the world. And by doing that, it, everything else sort of follows along. So in order to build the greatest products in the world, I have to have a great talented team. So, and to have a talented team, they need to know that their talent isn't going to be wasted. They're not going to be like Xerox and build a mouse. It's never going to be used. The public never sees it. So the great part of that is recognizing this talent and making sure that they are understanding that they're all part of this this team. And and part of that is to recognize your accomplishments again to the product. It's not about, hey, you've been in the company for four years. We're recognizing your anniversary. It's recognizing the milestones that all these teams accomplish. And in building small teams, the other thing we talked about is making the team small making the teams, but horizontal communication is critical. When Steve would get on the stage and say, I'm introducing an iPad, the greatest product in the world, you imagine if you worked on that product, how you felt about it. And then ultimately, 
never worried about the money, never worried about the stock price. That all sort of took care of itself because if you're building a great product and you're getting great sales of it, and the other thing Apple now has created, what I call the retail juggernaut, is they don't leave 30 35% commission on the table when they sell their product to somebody else. They have huge margins now, and that's a big plus for what they do. Because they've got the Apple stores? I mean, uh, exactly. th- those markups are really that big? So, so if someone buys a, a PC on Amazon.com, I mean, are they re- they're really getting 30 35% margin on that stuff? I can't believe it. Yeah, Amazon probably getting more like 12 to 18%, but if they went into Best Buy and bought it, they're leaving 30% there in the, in the store. So those channels have big, big cost. It costs also, when you go through those channels, it costs for marketing, it costs for things you do to promote your product in, in their sites and so forth, that all costs you. You go into an Apple store, you buy the product. First of all, you go into an Apple store, nobody ever talks to you about buying anything. You go in there and they will answer questions for you, but nobody says, what are you going to buy? You, you make that choice. It's a, it's a demo center. And what the, re- the reason you're drawn there is because it, you're so attracted to the product. I also sort of call it like a Trojan horse center that I have, a, I have a PC at home, but I have an iPhone. I go in there and look at all, look what I see. I see all this compatibility and how all these things work together. And yet, what do you think I'm going to buy next is a computer. <laughs> it all works together. Just that's for sure. Then that's a beautiful thing, the way it works together. Getting back to the team concept, in your book, you make this great comparison. It's a great metaphor of pirates versus the Navy. Now, most people would maybe think that the Navy, this big organized institution, is a great and powerful thing, but you don't think so, and and I guess Steve didn't either, huh? No, we were, we were, we didn't want to have bureaucracy, politics, you know, the power of the position sort of creep into the, into what I'll call a startup mentality. We wanted people to feel empowered. We wanted them to feel like they could be open and not worry about you know who they're meeting with or what what the title is or what the policy is or what the bureaucracy. So we tried to find a metaphor that would sort of fit that mold. And so uh, actually, there was a guy named Jay Shiat. Shiat Day was the company that did all the advertising for uh, for Apple in, in the early days. And Steve and him had dinner one night, and Steve came back and said, "Hey, I think I have the metaphor. We're going to use pirates, not the Navy." And it made sense. And that really was what we inspired our employees. We even had a skull and crossbones flag flying above the above the building. I mean, that's unheard of. Just go walk, walk by a big corporation, and there one of the flags flying is a skull and, skull and crossbones. I mean, that's you're trying great. to figure a way to keep people focused on the importance of getting the product done right, focused on making the milestones they've been attached to what they're going to do, and not get caught up in the process of a of them and the organizations. That really was, that was really why we did that. Well, with that, I've got to ask you, I'm going to call it the Steve Jobs uniform. I mean, he didn't always wear that. That developed later. But I was talking to a friend of mine about the the, the, the 501 jeans and the, and the black uh, turtleneck. <laughs> and, right. and, and I was saying, what, what's that all about? And he said, maybe it's just sort of the Einstein mentality. And I go, well, what does that mean? And he says, just don't waste any energy on your wardrobe, any any <laughs> mental energy. Just wear the same thing. <laughs> well, I think on the, the other side, though, Steve was, first of all, Steve, there was two parts of Steve. One was his very personal life, and the other was the Apple. And I think that Apple, at Apple, he, they were two separate lives, two separate beings almost, because Steve was a very shy person in his personal life. He was very private, and you notice there was never, he never even gave any public appearances, very few even speeches. I and mean, the most famous one, the one at Stanford. But in his Apple thing, what he wanted to do was when he's standing on stage introducing an iPhone, he wants you to focus on one thing, the iPhone. He's there representing in his hand the greatest product in the world. He doesn't want to distract from that. So he's not going to be there wearing a, you know, a Armani suit with a great tie and whatever. He wanted just to fold into the background and that all you focus on is a product. And I think that's really was a, in the early days, he mostly wore his funny, he wore white t-shirts when I met him, but he did go through a period of time and sort of the, when Apple started growing up into sort of more corporate look, but uh, ultimately I think he decided that he needed to fold into the background. We'll be back in just a minute. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn about investing in and managing income properties for college students, there's a show for that. If you want to learn how to get noticed online and in social media, 
there's a show for that. If you want to know how to save on life's largest expense, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know about America's crime of the century, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. Well, so one of the things that's interesting is that I've, I've heard that, and I, I believe on the 60 Minutes piece about him recently, that he combined these sort of different parts of life. And one of them that I found really interesting was when he made his products and thought of the way product development should occur, he included the humanities. You know, I'm having a little trouble connecting that one. What what does that mean? When you look up humanities, they talk about the study of it in college and the classics and things. But what do they mean by that? I mean, just ease of use, user interface, or what are they talking about? Yeah, I think we get, uh, in, in particularly the technology business, we get caught up in what I call technology engineering. We get caught up in, wow, I just made the fastest chip in the world, and this does, or this, this drive does this, or this screen does this. But the humanity means is that ultimately there's a, and yet the judge of how good a product is is the person who buys it and uses it. And I think that that's where it be, that's where humanity comes in. What is the purpose of this product? What do you really want to accomplish with it? And what is it doing for me, the user? And um, I think that's the other insight to the Apple products that they have set me free. It's a seamless interaction I have with all this information I'm dealing with through Apple products. I think that's where the humanity. And think about this. Apple products are used, I just saw one the other day where a kid was only three years old, was using an iPad um, and loving it, and so it goes all the way from a three-year-old to a 95-year-old. I mean, it, it, it covers all of the world, and most, think about it, not many products do that. I mean, that's the other part of humanity, which is important. Jay, and I'll, I'll have you know, it, it actually spans one, one year younger than that, because I've seen two-year-olds <laughs> using iPads. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it's pretty incredible. I, I, I bet you, you can't hand them a PC, a Lenovo, and have them do that, right? <laughs> exactly. They, and the other part of the humanity thing is that education. I think Apple has been, and Steve, one thing Steve was criticized about was he never appeared to give a lot of money to any, to any foundations. And, but if you think about it, his passion was education. So he, they gave millions and millions of computers, millions and millions of development time, big discounts to the education systems in the world. And education, Apple is, I go to, I have two sons in high school. When I go walk down the hall, I walk between the Apple lab and the, and the HP lab, uh, the HP lab is empty and the Apple lab is totally crowded. And I mean, that's, that's, that's what I consider part of humanity. Yeah, right. And it's the same way with the retail stores. You look at the new Microsoft stores, and there's hardly anybody there. But boy, at any Apple store on the planet, and I've been to many of them, you don't know there's a recession if you walk into an Apple store. That's for sure, huh? No, of course. And look at their financial. I mean, look at the store in Manhattan. It's going to do over half a billion dollars in sales this year in just one store. I mean, it's just it's phenomenal. Do you, do you yeah, know I it, heard that, that that is now the most photographed building in New York City, and it's mostly underground. Right. Uh, I, I've been to that one. And it's more photographed than, say, the Empire State Building or Ground Zero or anything else now. Right. And uh, it's sort of funny because also the other one, this unbelievable one, is in Shanghai. I mean, it is unbelievable. And um, way back when, actually, I am Pei, who's one of the world's famous uh, architects. Architects, sure, um, yeah. He, uh, we had actually had him design the first Apple campus, and it was going to have be have almost like Disneyland. It was going to have a tram running around it, and the and the roofs of the buildings were going to be uh, glass, so you could actually look in the building when you went by to see what was happening. But unfortunately, that never got off the ground. And although Steve's last appearance was to present his new building concept to the city council of Cupertino, and so I, when he did that, I thought, wow, that's he's finally fulfilled one of his last dreams, which was the, the Apple campus. Fantastic. What was Steve's secret in, in hiring and in, in tapping into the best talent? I mean, you talked about not having bureaucracy and not having this hierarchical kind of organization and how people could go directly and talk to people. And, and you sort of got that formality out of the way, obviously. But, right. but, but I mean, I've heard some definitely some negative things about Steve that he was difficult to work with, incredibly demanding, and, and all, all those kinds of things. And I'm sure you know about them. What was his secret to tapping into talent and, and hiring right and that kind of thing? 
he really had a way about him that when you got interviewed by Steve, there was a, it was interesting. He would throw out things and then see how you would react. He would throw out either concepts, he'd throw out things that potentially could be negative, and then he would sort of judge sort of your reaction to it. And being interviewed by Steve was an interesting thing because you sort of got in tune with him you know, very quickly about what he, his vision and everything, but he also was a master of finding out who you really are underneath all of that and who and what he thinks how your talent is going to f- fit into what he needs to get done in his vision of the product. I think that's really the, the secret. Even, you know, I always use a lot of times in interviews say to somebody, have you ever been fired? And if I say that to somebody, I'm not, I don't care about the answer. I care about the reaction because a lot of people don't want to tell you that. So you just sort of judge by the reaction. And I think Steve was a master of sort of laying out parts of his vision, laying out parts of his ideas about the company, the product, or what he wants you to do, and then see how you react to it. And then, and then after that, he did, did inc- he was an incredible sales guy. But I think that's part of it. It's part of looking at talent is trying to see under the covers who you are and is that going to fit into what what you want to get done? I think that's really important. Who were Steve's, you know, like who did Steve really look up to? Who, who were his idols and mentors? Uh, well, there were several of them weren't, weren't alive. Henry Ford was clearly one of Steve's mentors, but he wasn't alive. Gutenberg, obviously, who invented the, the press. So what he, he looked at people who had done significant things sort of to change the way the world operated. I think... It, you know, Dr. Land, the guy that did the Polaroid camera, was one of his big, big uh, heroes. And in fact, we went and met with him once in Rochester, New York. So it's people like that that he felt had taken either technology and used it to convert what culture was doing or society was doing. Thomas Edison was another one. So there wasn't many. I think Bob Noyce was one in the before he died in Silicon Valley. I always viewed Bob Noyce as being sort of the the pre-Steve Jobs, he was sort of, I saw sort of viewed Bob as sort of the guy that looked, was a lot, lot like Steve Jobs, but he, he came a lot before Steve Jobs. So, and who was Bob Noyce? Sorry. Bob Noyce is one of the co-founders of Intel. Oh, okay. So Bob Noyce is, was the, was the co, co-inventor of the semiconductor with a guy for the professor from Stanford. So he really was the, he was really the inspiration that created Silicon Valley. And then he helped found um, Intel. So that's where he came from couple of rather amazing comments I've heard after his passing, and I believe they were from the 60 Minutes interview. One is that he credited a lot of his success to taking LSD. Comment on that? <laughs> it's a pretty controversial <laughs> <Yes>. statement. <laughs> right. I, that might have been early on in his life, but certainly wasn't later in his life. I think that I think he was really into this sort of being able to see into the future and being able to look through the the mass of what was happening around him being being sort of away from it. I know that he was a practicing Buddhist. Uh, he was concerned about diet. I mean, he never drank or smoked. And I think he just looked at the purity of trying to look at the purity of thought. And I'm not, I mean, a lot of this, I saw part of that. I also read part of that new book, which I don't like, by the way, and I don't give a lot of credit to the author because actually I'm, I'm in it and I'm falsely represented in it, so I'm, I have a negative opinion of that interview. Okay, fair enough. One of the other things, though, that I thought was really telling and, and difficult, and maybe you can give some insight into this, is that in that interview, they said that Steve always, he was always striving to make the product simple and clean. And he said, it's hard to make something simple. It's easy to make it complicated, which is somewhat counterintuitive, really, but I don't think it is, but some people might judge it that way. And I guess a lot of his concept of simplicity came from Buddhism, right? Exactly. In fact, if you look at Buddhism, one of the most simple products that um, sort of everybody applauds is the egg. If you look at an egg, it's incredibly simple, but it's very effective. It protects the inside of it very well, has a great design to it, great texture to it. All these sort of kind of, if you think about it, wow, that's a simple product. And I think that was, even in the early days of Macintosh, we always wanted to produce a product that didn't need an owner's manual. So that was the other, the ultimate statement of simplicity is no owner's manual needed. You don't get an owner's manual when you buy an egg. It's pretty simple to use. So it's like, that was the, the sort of the ultimate goal of of an Apple product, which today that's true. You don't get an owner's manual with an Apple product. Um, you, you get a little fact, tiny thing in there, maybe fingertips with your iPhone or something. Yeah. But the funny thing about it is you get a lot of insight to your new products from other Apple users. <laughs> 
my my 15 year old is my perfect is my Apple guy. So he tells me how what I can do to make my product more effective. So it's really interesting about this. Then you sort of develop sort of this inner cult of people that sort of talk about it together, which is sort of interesting. Yeah, I just wanted to, before we go, give you the opportunity to talk about any stages of the company. He left and came back, and of course, Apple was really on the rocks when, when Steve was gone. If you want to talk about any of that, and then I just want to ask you about the branding and the sort of the coolness. I mean, Steve really made computing cool. Right. Yeah, well, first of all, the, when Steve was at Apple, Apple turned out to be a big problem. Obviously, it's a Scully era, and Scully was not the right guy to run Apple. The board of directors threw Steve out, which is a huge mistake. In fact, I went to the board and told them they're making a big mistake, and I got I got rewarded by being fired myself uh, later on. But uh, but it's, the problem that happened is that the products were going in the wrong direction. The Mac was clearly a consumer product trying to be put into corporate America. But when Steve left, he learned a big lesson, a couple of things. One, he learned that in his heart, he was a consumer guy. He was not a corporate America equipment manufacturers. So he learned about consumerism. He learned that who he was and what he was really excited about. That sort of came out in Pixar when he took over Pixar. The time he took over Pixar, the longest movie they'd ever produced was two minutes in length. And so he's, the first thing he said, we need a product because he's a product guy. So Toy Story came out of that. So he learned after leaving Apple and that scene and seeing Apple sort of disintegrate that he learned his lesson about he's a consumer guy, he wants to make products for the person, and he also learned that to do that, you got to have the right company structure, you got to have the right board of directors, and he also learned that he has to be in charge. In order to make that happen, he had to be the CEO. So those are all the lessons he learned by the failure of Next, the success of Pixar, and then coming back to Apple was able to, to implement that. So that I think that was an important era for, for Apple and for, for Steve coming back. And a lot of the concepts that Steve came back with, we'd already been talking about in the late 80s. I mean, in 85 and 86, we were talking about, you know, the, the consumer product and putting it into stores and all that other stuff. He even, we even talked about in 84 about the concept, which eventually became Dell nine years later. And um, so Steve had a lot of the stuff already going in his mind. He just had, he just had that opportunity. And you think about it, he was worth about $6 billion with his Disney deal he didn't need to come back to Apple, but he just saw that as an unfulfilled dream. Yeah, it's it's really amazing that he he lived really, frankly, a very modest life, and I, I was surprised to hear that. Like at his house, did he have a security guard at least? Or I mean, this is this no. Is... In fact, uh, when he bought when he bought his first big mansion up in uh, Woodside, it was fifteen thousand square feet. It was uh, been owned by the, uh, the creator of Conoco Copper, and I went up to visit him after he moved in. He was living in the maid's quarter because the maid's quarter was connected to the kitchen where he had his cooks. And so the rest of this house was empty. There was nothing in it. I mean, it's like I'm not sure he ever put anything in it. I mean, he, he lived very minimally, and, um, and you would never know it. And even his home up in Palo Alto was open to anybody. I mean, you could see him drive out every morning if you wanted to pay attention. The sad part about the ending of his life was that he got, was under so much scrutiny that paparazzi they couldn't they couldn't wait to take photographs of him hobbling out of his house that was really too bad that is too bad that was really sad it really is well jay just before we go give out your website if you would for the book and maybe if you want to just talk about what you do as well i I find that interesting in terms of your business yeah the the website is called the stevejobsway.com that's my that's my website it's my book is in um, 19 countries and 29 languages so it's doing very well in the world and fantastic reviews on amazon too Right. Yes. So if you go on there and if you go on there, you'll see reviews. And on there, if you go into press, it probably has about 30 or 40 reviews in there for almost every major publication in the world and, and all the TV stuff I've been on. So secondly, I'm still in the, I'm a software guy, so I'm still in the software business. I have a software company. We produce a, a, a way to accelerate information to the Internet. So it's called WAN Acceleration, Wide Area Network Acceleration. So we do with companies like Oracle or uh, – the other company, uh, Riverbed, do with hardware. We do with software, so that's a, that's what we do in our product. Secondly, we build apps. So I have a, a suite of apps that we call Family Safety that allows you to 
have emergency contacts and so forth. Those are the two things we do in my business. Fantastic. Well, Jay Elliott, thank you so much for joining us today. The book is The Steve Jobs Way, I Leadership for a New Generation. And very interesting to talk about this, very timely indeed. And, and we're sorry to see Steve pass. What a what an incredible man. I mean, the Thomas Edison of, uh, of, of the last decade and part of the last century as well. Right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Have you listened to the Creating Wealth series? I mean, from the beginning. If not, you can go ahead and get book one that shows one through 20 in digital download. These are advanced strategies for wealth creation. For more information, go to jasonhartman.com. This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.